Welcome to Practice Update. I'm your host, Dr. Jennifer Cottle, and joining me today is Dr. Wilfred Eberhardt. Dr. Eberhardt, welcome to the program. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, it's good to see you. So we're doing a little bit of a trial review about non-small cell lung cancer from ESMO 2017. Let's first talk a little bit about Checkmate 0153 immunotherapy in stage four non-small cell lung cancer. Yes, I think this was one of the most important studies that was presented by Dr. Spiegel. It's a randomized phase three trial that looked at the duration of immunotherapy mm -hmm. in uh, second and third line non-small cell lung cancer. Mm -hmm. Now, what did they look at? They looked at treatment uh, of nivolumab up to progression of disease mm -hmm. versus a fixed one year uh, administration of the drug and then stopped the drug. So it tells us about the duration, how long do we have to get for the treatment? And there was a significant benefit in PFS for those who were continually nivolumab. So, uh, and there's also already a signal that the overall survival is better in those patients who, continue, who were continued on nivolumab. So for the clinical practice, as of today, we would consider to keep the patients on immunotherapy as long as possible, up to the time point of progression or some toxicity issues or uh, when there is uh, uh, not the possibility to, to, con to continue the immunotherapy any longer. But this is important, uh, and I think it will, be, or it will have an important impact on practice because we cannot stop the drug. It's very interesting, very interesting. You know, let's, let's move forward a little bit. Um, we're, we're also going to hear updated results from the Keynote 021 Cohort G, uh, which evaluates pemetrexid carboplatin with or without pembrolizumab as first-line treatment for advanced non-small cell lung cancer. So how do you expect this study to influence clinical practice? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, I can, although there is a difference between the U.S. and uh, Europe. Now, in the U.S., there uh, has been uh, a registration for the drug. Um, in that clinical situation, after the very interesting results of the randomized phase two trial, uh, now the trial data, as they were presented here by uh, Dr. Borgai, again showed that there seems to be an impact. So, if you combine chemotherapy with immunotherapy, that makes a difference. Uh, especially in those patients who are not the high expressors. But for Europe, we are still very reluctant. We, are, we want to have randomized phase three evidence. Mm -hmm. And I think we need this because there are a lot of questions that are still open. For instance, what about a sequential schedule? You start off with induction hem conventional chemotherapy and they go into a maintenance immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. Or you give immunotherapy as a second line treatment after induction chemo. So um, there are still important issues. And do we need a combination of chemo and immunotherapy of pembrolizumab in the high expressors? We don't know. Maybe pembro is enough. So there are more questions than answers. And I think that is the reason why that administration schedule is not registered in Europe so far. That's really interesting. I think it's helpful to understand yeah. why perhaps the difference. Um, and, and, and I understand there are a lot of questions that we still yeah. have to answer. Um, you know, let's move a little forward a little bit. Can you speak about the Pacific study a bit? Well, the Pacific study is probably a practice-changing trial. Okay. Now, if we look at stage 3 non-small cell lung cancer, concurrent hemoradiotherapy, or multimodality treatments including concurrent hemoradiotherapy and surgery, these are the standards of treatment for most of the patients. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a very heterogeneous population. But the Pacific trial now looked into the possibility to give an immunotherapy consolidation. And the randomization was consolidation dovolumab versus placebo. And the, uh, there is a significant benefit, a significant clinical benefit, um, in the PFS, which was the primary endpoint. So the data, as we can also see them in the New England Journal, um, this is practice changing. And um, I think it won't be long since we have this as a new standard of care. 
It's interesting. It's very, it's very exciting as well. Yeah. You know, very exciting. Um, so let's shift focus again. Um, let's shift focus to the ALK-positive uh, metastatic non-small non cell lung cancer setting. Um, we're going to hear uh, CNS efficacy results from the ALEX study, comparing electinib to crizotinib. So what do, we all, what do we already know from this trial, and why are these data important? So let me be open. Uh, we have a saying, everything works in the brain, that works in the peripheral tum tumor locations. Mm. So conventional chemotherapy works in the brain if you have an objective response in a primary tumor in a metastasis at some place else. But what for the first time the Alex trial showed was that in those patients who didn't have brain metastasis up front, there was a protective effect on the drug for the patients to not develop brain metastasis. Mm -hmm. And this is very similar to the, let's say, we do prophylactic cranial irradiation in small cell lung cancer mm -hmm. as a prophylaxis. Now, the alectinib was able, probably because it, its penetration in the, to the blood-brain barrier is so good that it has a protective effect on the patients to develop brain metastasis. Mm -hmm. and it, this was highly significant. So the cumulative rate of brain relapse in those patients who didn't have a brain metastasis up front, yeah. it was significantly less in those who received uh, alectinib. Mm. So I think that is, a, that is a very interesting finding for the first time that we see that. We, we can also see it probably with, with osimertinib in EGFR mutated patients. But now we have the ALK mutated patients. They have a high risk of developing brain metastasis. Yeah. And we can give alectinib as a kind of prophylaxis also. Mm -hmm. Again, very, it's very interesting and yeah, very exciting. I think it's outstanding. It's the first, yeah. it's probably the first, with osimertinib, these are the first two drugs that show this prophylactic effect. That's amazing. That's really so, amazing. And the efficacy in the brain is, is very high. That again, we, were, we've been seen in those patients who had brain meds up front. Right. So it's very effective in that situation. But again, that, that is not so exciting for me. For me, more exciting is the prophylactic effect. Right, right, understood, understood. Well, Dr. Eberhardt, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insights. Thank you, Jennifer. Nice and to be with you. It's good to be with you as well. And thank you for joining us at Practice Update.